Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're going to look at Acts 9, 1 through 9. Uh, we have looked at this passage in the past. Uh, I think that I taught this like three years ago and some change. Uh, so if you've been with the Redemption Church since the very, very beginning, uh, pardon the redundancy, but I find that it's quite relevant to what we're doing right now. Uh, as we go through this year of just teachings and prophecy, I want us to see how that prophecy is a powerful evangelistic tool. In yesterday's devotion, we got a little bit more context on Philip in Acts chapter 8 and the massive, literally murderous opposition he was facing. Stephen, one of Philip's colleagues in that original class of seven preachers who are dispatched, uh, was killed. And Saul of Tarsus is there giving his approval to the whole thing. Imagine the hard-heartedness that's going on in such a man. This guy is the least likely to be saved in the world, it would seem. He had impeccable pedigree. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was raised as a Pharisee, which means that he was like the head of his class from Beit Sefer to Beit Talmud to Beit Midrash. And he was tutored by the most renowned rabbi in the world, Gamaliel, who was tutored by the most renowned rabbi in the world in his day, Hillel. So this guy had the most impressive resume in the intelligentsia of the Jewish world. And he's murderous. And he's even breathing out murderous threats with full authority to arrest followers of the way. That's what they called Christians before in the Pisidian city of Antioch. We were given this pejorative moniker, meaning little Christs, Christians. Look at what God did to that murderous, highly educated, legally endowed, hard-hearted man. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Okay, so tell me again how much opposition you have in your personal evangelistic life. Okay, tell me again how scared you are to bring up the gospel with your friend your coworker, because you're afraid it's not going to go well. Is he breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord? If not, buck up. And if so, uh, do this, <laughs> right? Like pray that the Holy Spirit of God does this. Pray that the Spirit of Jesus appears like he does here. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I, I, I suppose I should correct myself. I called him the spirit of Jesus. That's because I, I suspect this is what happened in Acts 16, Numa Yesu. The spirit of Jesus appears to Paul and company and redirects them on another path, tells them not to go that way. And by telling them not to go that way, they end up going exactly where God wants them to go. Uh, this really is Jesus, <laughs> right? Like not, not the angel of the Lord. This is not a Christophany as in the Old Testament. This is the, this is the resurrected Jesus. And here I think is the moment of Saul's conversion. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, vocative case comma, Lord, Saul said. All right. And the question, who are you? is confounding given a man of such education. There was a pastor um, I knew in seminary. He was a great guy and a friend of mine. He and I helped uh, revamp and start up this first priority Bible study club at Ransom Middle School in Florida. Ended up becoming the biggest first priority club in the state, if I remember correctly, because they asked us to come in and present what we did. And, and we were like, oh, it's kind of the, we kind of threw out your model <laughs> and we just provided food, you know, and my aunt was the, the chorus director and she let us use the chorus room and get kids off the bus and feed them and share the gospel. Um, and like this guy was a pastor of many years um, and he was converted under his own preaching. He grew up the son of a pastor, so he had a whole lot of knowledge about the Bible, and it seemed like kind of a no-brainer career move. 
And then he's serving as a youth pastor and he's at this event and he's speaking and on stage while sharing the gospel, like he comes to believe it himself. And so he was sort of pseudo martyreo before that. And uh, then he goes and sits down with like the elders of the church and tells them, look, I've got some news. <laughs> and so uh, I believe that they gave him some time, you know, uh, and, and he came back you know, it was even baptized and they kind of explained the whole thing to the church. And it was a little bit weird. Not everybody really received it well, but I, I, I know this brother in Christ and I've seen him bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And as much as I can tell, he's truly saved. But what's cool about his testimony is that like, it's, it, it bears some similarity to this moment. Who are you? I mean, like someone who has degrees in theology, asking God who he is, you can, you can amass a huge amount of knowledge and not really know God. That's why we're doing this, right? Uh, in all honesty, some of it is because I'm going on a mission trip, right? I'm going to be speaking uh, at in, in a few different countries that are 97% Muslim, and uh, we'll have provisions made for teachings while I'm gone. Um, but also, I genuinely, truly don't want us just to become a Bible study club Right? I don't want us to just be a bunch of nerds who get together and geek out over how cool prophecy is because it is objectively just cool. You know, I mean, like Daniel showing King Cyrus how 150 years before he was even born, he was named in this passage from Isaiah. Like, that's cool. That's just cool. Right. Uh, but the coolness is not the point. There's way more to it than that. It's entirely possible that you could amass a huge amount of knowledge about prophecy and end times and eschatology and not really know God. I mean, like, I doubt any of us will ever be as educated and esteemed as res and respected as Saul of Tarsus was. And when he's face to face with God, his quest first words are, who are you? But then the next word, I believe this is the Holy Spirit, Lord. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. There are a lot of politicians in Seattle who are going to hear these words. Right? There, there are a lot of people in government who are going to hear these words. And in election season, right, the time, your time of viewing this, um, you are like a week out from the presidential election day. And our prayer for, for people who are persecuting the church should be for their conversion like this. Because they're going to see Jesus one day. They're going to all know that he's Lord one day. And what's really in the nation's best interest and what should be the primary aim of Christians is not that they get their comeuppance because we're not going to get ours. By all of grace, we will be absolved for every last one of our sins. And so who are we? to hold other people's feet to the fire for their own sin. When we've received grace, we should pray that they receive the same grace because they're going to see Jesus one day. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. So imagine the gut check moment this was for Paul, excuse me, Saul, <laughs> right? He's always named Saul. He's always, he still has the name Paul, but he starts going by Paul later in his ministry because his ministry is largely to the Gentiles. And Paul and Saul are like the same name, but Paul's the more Gentile friendly version of the name. It's not that he went through a name change. He always had the name Paul, but he starts going by Paul because he's going to bring the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. He starts with the Jews. They all reject him. Then he goes to the Gentiles. They all get saved. But get up and go into the city. Sorry, not all. And you will be told what you must do. All right. So it's vague. Uh, the only specificity here is to go into the city. He goes into Damascus. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. When we get to the book of Daniel, remember this, because Daniel had a similar experience centuries prior to this. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Okay, that's not random. His eyes were open, he could see nothing. As you engage your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, your family member with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they may have ears that function, um, but they're not really hearing the truth. And they may have eyes that function, but they're not really seeing what's real. And, and they may have hearts that beat, but they are 
hard as stone. Paul, in this moment of conversion, which is unique. Usually when people are blind, they're healed and they believe in Jesus. I mean, Jesus healed multiple blind people in scripture, but this is sort of the opposite, isn't it? Uh, and upon his encounter with Jesus, he's left blinded. And it's emblematic of how blind he was before. Even with his eyes stricken, temporarily unable to see, he actually sees now better than ever. His eyes were open. He could see nothing. All right, this is, this is emblematic of the same hard-heartedness that you'll encounter here in the greater Seattle area. They have eyes that are open, but they can't see yet. So they took him by the hand and they led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. So this encounter between the persecutor of the church and the resurrected Jesus leads to one of the most important moments uh, in the first century, the conversion of Saul. Who are you? Right there in verse five, Lord. I would argue that's one of the most important and pivotal moments in the first century. Because this is the guy who would go on missionary journeys and bring the gospel all throughout, eventually, uh, the, the northern coast of the, of the Mediterranean into Europe. Right? What would later become known as Europe. And, and that's where the gospel was fertilized and grew. And then the, the Puritans would bring it to the new world. And here I am because of that. And, and, and it all can be traced back to the book of Acts. In this moment, who are you, Lord? Oh, the world was transformed when Saul was transformed. And he was the least likely guy. The least likely. Right? Imagine like, I understand that ISIS is sort of making a comeback Imagine like the commander of ISIS being saved, right? This, this organization that kills Christians, not just Christians, multiple people too. But it's the most contemporary example I can think of. I mean, like Saul of Tarsus had just overseen the first martyrdom of the New Testament, and he's breathing out murderous threats in the very opening of the text. He's breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Like, think about anyone today if you don't like my ISIS commander example, think of another example of somebody who's breathing out murderous threats against disciples of Jesus, okay? And imagine that dude being saved. No one is beyond the reach of God's arm. No one. No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Anyone could be saved. And every salvation is radical, Okay, the drama of a testimony is not its power. The power of a testimony is the Holy Spirit who converts. And the same Holy Spirit who converted Saul can convert your boss, can convert your coworker, your bitter neighbor, your political rival. Anyone who's currently breathing out murderous threats against Jesus could be saved. I know this because I have met one of them. If you dig through my Facebook feed, you'll see me, playing worship music. <clears throat> I'm drumming on a cajon. He's playing on a guitar. We left his face out of the shot because his own government is hunting him. And uh, he was an aspiring jihadist. He was breathing out murderous threats against disciples of Jesus. And his first target was going to be his own biological sister. And in that moment with a pitchfork in his hand, the Holy Spirit of God came upon him and he saved he was breathing out murderous threats against a disciple of the Lord and he was saved. And now he's a pastor. So like no one is beyond saving. I've seen militant atheists, one of whom had, had a, tattoo on, a tattoo chronicling the number of Christians that he claims to have dissuaded the gospel, saved. I've seen more than one person with a devil tattooed on his body saved. No one is beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit to radically convert. Saul of Tarsus is an example of that. So as we study prophecy and we see one of the most powerful evidences in scripture of the truth of scripture and scripture alone, don't write anyone off. Pray what would now seem like an audacious prayer, but in light of Saul's testimony seems actually, uh, quite common of God to do, <laughs> pray right now for this, for the soul in your life.